every single person to get your Bible open, whether you're here in this sanctuary or if you are at home watching this or even listening to it. Let's open up your Bibles. Let's see what the Word of God says. Let's draw our inspiration, our truth from the Word of God and the Word of God alone. First of all, before we get started, and this is going to be, I think, a bit of a hard-hitting sermon as we basically do an autopsy on our own church. And what a time to do an autopsy on your own church in the midst of a pandemic when half of our church is not even coming out to in-person services. So it's very difficult because we don't even know how many people are coming to Cornerstone or how many people call Cornerstone their home anymore. Um, and you kind of can see a little bit of what our enemy is doing in the midst of this pandemic. It's really to put Christians alone again, which I would tell you our flesh would love to do. And so I really appreciate all of you who are coming out. And um, for those who are watching online, I know some of you have really, really good reasons to do that. I have very good friends who live with aged parents and have um, children with compromised systems, and I think it's very important to be safe with that. If you're able, we would love to see you back here, and worshiping in person together, there's nothing like it, and we got a taste of that again at Lopat Park when hundreds of us gathered, and man, I tell you what, to go from that back to uh, missing a lot of them, it's very difficult, so I just want to encourage you to be here and to worship together. Here's what I really want to encourage you, and you can do this whether you are, you are here right now in person or if you're watching this online. I would encourage you, if you're here in person, to go back to the next steps after this message. If you're watching this online, go to our website. You'll find the same steps or the same thing called next steps. And join a, gr a growth group. More than ever, we need to be in growth groups. All the more, right? As the, as the day of the Lord approaches, the Bible says. And I know that for a lot of Christians, they, would, um, they find it difficult. I think they've had probably bad experiences in a life group. Maybe in my life groups. I don't know. I've led a whole lot of them. But uh, maybe they've had a bad experience in a life group and... The thought of being in a small group of men and women, or men or women, if that's the nature of the group, is alarming. There's not a lot of places to hide. That's sort of the goal. That's sort of the object of a growth group, so that we could be Christians not hiding and not pretending, but be utterly real and raw and honest with one another. I tell you what, one of the things that makes me... Um, I think more honored than anything as a pastor is when somebody tells me that Cornerstone Church is a loving church. And that's what we want to be. We want to be a kind of church where everybody is loved. Even if you struggle with terrible sin, we will love you. We want to be merciful. We want to be kind. And so I hope that you will be that way as well with each other. All right, Acts chapter 2, here we go. I'd like to... Um, have you think about something for a moment, and which is kind of why I said all that I said a moment ago, I want you to think about this question. What has been to this point in your life the best church experience you've ever had? So what I'm asking is, go back in your mind, and I want you to think for a moment. What has been the most rewarding, the most rich, the most powerful, the most satisfying church experience in your life. And I want you to begin to think for a moment, what made that such a wonderful experience for you? Now, I, I got to tell you that I've sat in your place thousands of times listening to preaching. And I know it's really hard to truly think about a preacher's question when the preacher keeps talking. Well, some of you actually are very good at tuning me out. I do want you to know that. I believe it's a gift of your flesh, not a spiritual gift. But for a lot of us, you know, you know I ask you a question and I know there's probably not much going on in there. 
that's not a slam on your intellect. That's just, you're trying to listen to the next thing I'm going to say. So I'm going to really ask you to think, what made that church experience so rewarding? What made it so powerful, so beautiful? I'll give you a few options. Maybe it was a church where it seemed everyone was involved. That's usually a small church. You get to a larger church, that begins to disappear. Maybe it was a church where everyone loved each other, or the preaching impacted you every week, or people kept getting saved. I mean, I don't really think there's much more exciting to experience in a church than salvation. That's uber exciting. Maybe it was a church where the Holy Spirit was producing signs and miracles and wonders or repentance or there were altar calls i read i didn't read i had somebody tell me a week ago one of their kids visited a church and in that church the um, guest speaker he was an evangelist came in and and did a wonder of the spirit he started calling people up front and he said here's your middle name and and nobody knew, how did that man know those middle names? I don't know. Was it the Spirit? I don't know. But maybe, maybe that's a church that you've been in. It was just powerful. Well, today in Acts chapter 2, now I want you to get your Bibles open. If you haven't done it yet, I'm giving you a, another encouragement to do it. Acts chapter 2, we're going to see what makes a powerful church. And I will tell you something now that you need to know. There is no powerful church unless it is a spirit-filled church i'm gonna say it again there is no truly powerful church unless that church is filled with the spirit and that church will not be filled with the spirit if that church is not exalting christ and not centered on his word I want you to notice in verse 42, before I even start, the first of four points I'm going to give you. Actually, there's seven, but the first of these points. I want you to notice a phrase, and they devoted themselves, just stop it right there for a moment. Because that word devoted means regular, continual persistence in something. Let's just say you devoted yourself to exercise. You devoted yourself to training to do a triathlon. You're not going to be able to do a triathlon. In most cases, you're not going to be able to do any endurance sport unless you devote yourself to regular, persistent, continual training. That's exactly what this means. This early church, brand new believers, devoted themselves regularly, all of them, to four things and i'm going to bring those to you here are four priorities of a spirit-filled church now we get to do an autopsy at, on cornerstone and we get to see is this evidence here of a spirit-filled church and i'm going to tell you right now to save you the autopsy report we're going to come up short and if we're going to match, if we're going to exceed what we've been before, if we're really truly going to be a spirit-filled church, then we all have to together devote ourselves to these four things. Number one, the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now we'll read that. In fact, let's just read it. Here we go, chapter 2. Let's look at verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Here, here, there's your four marks of a spirit-filled church. We saw last week in verse 41. Can everybody look at that for a moment? It's pretty amazing. I've never seen this in my life. About 3,000 people got saved from a sermon. I mean, that's just incredible. And so the week's following that the days and the weeks following that sermon this brand new thing called the church had to develop ways to organize themselves and function together in what would be an increasingly hostile world 
So you've got to really get your mind around this. This is not like you visited a church of 3,000 people and they've got a lot of things going on. You're visiting, if you're here in this audience, you're visiting a brand new church that's trying to figure out what to do as they go along. And they know this, we better be devoted to the apostles' teaching. Now, you've got to go back to the 3,000 number. Remember, this is the day of Pentecost. There are Jews and there are Gentile converts that are in Jerusalem from all over the world. So some of them are leaving to go back. And they're going to be carrying the seeds of the gospel with them, which is pretty awesome in itself. We're going to see that in Acts. But we've still got hundreds of brand new believers who stayed in Jerusalem. They immediately band together and they begin to learn, but learn what? Now, my, my effort today in this message, at least the first portion of it, is to get you out of your Americanized mindset and into a first century Jewish early church, brand new believer mindset. Because, listen, they didn't have the New Testament. They didn't have yet the letters written by James and Peter and John and very soon Paul. But the truths that would be in those letters were being taught before they were written. It's the apostles' teaching. Now, this is something that I think you might find interesting. 1873. 1873. There was an archbishop searching through the library of the Jerusalem monastery located in Constantinople, Turkey. And he discovered in that library a manuscript that dates all the way back to around 60 to 70 AD. And that manuscript was called the Didache. The Didache. And in the Didache is a summary of all of the early church's teachings on baptism, on Lord's Supper, preaching, reading, worship. All of these subjects are, were written in AD 60 in this thing called the Didache. And the early believers, now listen, get out of your Americanized mindset. The early believers, they didn't have the New Testament. They didn't have copies even of the Hebrew Scriptures. I mean, just think for a moment. I, no hands, but how many of you brought your Bibles? I could tell you probably too few, but I hope all of you did, that nobody in the early church had a Bible. Nobody had a copy of the Hebrew Scriptures. They were expensive. They were written on scrolls. They're in the synagogues, but nobody other than the synagogue leaders and wealthy priests would have a copy of it. So they're coming, and they are entirely dependent on the preaching and the teaching and the apostles' teachings. And they gave all of their allegiance to those teachings. As the apostles would explain the Old Testament and the teachings of Jesus, they gathered in single-minded devotion with the goal of learning how to live like Jesus. That's devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, let's practice this, by the way, after each of these points. How devoted are you to the Word of God? You see, I know for a fact, because I've had people tell me this, that they get their learning from when we preach to them. And I'm going to tell you, you're never going to become very deeply rooted in your, in your faith if the only time you're ingesting the Word of God, learning from the Word of God, is when you're hearing somebody preach the Word of God. Even if you're listening to podcasts throughout the week, that's not the same. God will speak through me. God will speak through a pastor in this pulpit. God will speak through those preachers on those podcasts. But listen, he's preaching a message that he has prepared in my heart for you. How about go personally to the Lord and let him speak directly to your heart? That is way more intimate, way more robust, way more beautiful, and way more powerful. That's what it means to be devoted regularly to the word of God. 
And if you want to be a spirit-filled church, and if we want to be a spirit-filled church, we all must be devoted to God's word. Number two, they're devoted regularly to the fellowship. Now, each of these, I want you to see something. Can you, I'm going to teach you some super, super boring grammar. And it's going to take me 10 seconds. So look at verse 42. And they devoted themselves to, look at the word, right before apostles' teaching. The. It's a conjunction. But in the Greek and in the English, it's a definite article. So here we go. We've got the teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. So this puts it into a different category, and I'm going to explain that as we go. There is nothing, John Wesley said, that is more unchristian than a solitary Christian. Wow. Now, you remember, we're Americans, right? We're pragmatic, proudly independent, individualistic in our mindset. We were taught, many of us, don't depend on anybody. They're going to let you down. John Wesley said there's nothing more unchristian than a solitary believer. But what really is fellowship? Now, this is the fellowship, which means it's a formalized fellowship. This isn't just hanging out after church. Hey, let's go to Seta Luna. Let's go grab some coffee. This is the fellowship. This is a very organized, very intentional part of the early church, and they were devoted regularly to it. But what really is fellowship? It's really a fantastic word. It means to hold something in common. It means to share a partnership with somebody. It's actually a word that you use for marriage. It's a word that you use for business partners. But when you put the word the before it, it means the church, the community of believers who intentionally gathered regularly because they had something in common that they didn't have with those in the world. And what the believers had in common were the great spiritual realities of their new life in Christ. Now listen, I've got friends that I almost started singing in low places. I don't know what happened to me just now. I'm glad of the self-control of the Spirit. But I've got friends that are not believers. And i got to tell you that as much as I love them, as much as I care for them, when I meet with them, I have fun, but they don't nourish my spirit. But when I meet with my Christian friends, I almost invariably, almost inevitably, come away encouraged, emboldened, enjoying the purity and the joy of fellowship. You cannot have that with non-believing friends, which is one of the dangers, which is one of the warnings in Proverbs. He who is wise will be with the wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. If you make all of your best friends unbelievers they're going to do nothing to edify your life and strengthen you in christ which is why we want to encourage fellowship which is simply and beautifully the one another's of the new testament let I me mean, think for a second if you know your new testament think i'm just give you a few of them here's some of the one another's confess your sins to one another bear one another's burdens Share with one another, encouraging one another, loving one another, exhorting one another. And when you live in that fellowship, your life cannot help but be encouraged in Christ. A really super weird name, Tertullian. He was known as the father of Latin theology. He was born in 160 AD. He reported that when Rome, this is amazing and true, when Rome became suspicious of the early church, you know what they did? True story. They sent spies into the church. And those spies came back to the authorities of Rome and they, re and they reported that the Christians were peculiar. Man, I, I love that. I hope people say to us that we're peculiar for the right reason. And that they had no idols. This was bizarre to the Romans. 
They called the Christians pagans because they would not worship the pantheon, the goddess and goddesses of Rome. Why won't they worship multiple gods? All of the rest of us do. They would only worship one god. They had no idols, but worshiped one by the name of Jesus who was not there. And then the spies said, and I'm going to quote them, I'm going to quote Tertullian, how those Christians love each other and how they are ready to die for each other other now i could use a pastoral technique called shaming and guilting it's lovely isn't it to be on the receiving end of that and ask you how many of you would die for somebody in this church i mean that's just dumb so let me ask you a better question how many of you would actually live for people in this church and actually spend time in fellowship and in growth groups and inviting people to your homes and inviting people out after church and saying, you know what, I believe in fellowship. I believe that when we have something in common, who is Jesus, that you're going to go away edified and I'm going to go away edified and there's nothing sweeter than being together with those whom we're going to be with for eternity. Now, i got to hurry because you're not listening fast enough. So let's get to number three. To the breaking of bread. Notice the definite article again. There's a couple meanings of this phrase. Number three, breaking of bread. One of which is simply sharing a meal together. But that's what's more in mind in verse 46, if you look at it. We're going to get to that in a minute. There's no the in front of that. Here, in verse 42, Luke wrote about the breaking of bread. He's the one that wrote Acts. And he puts the, de the word the, a definite article. He's describing the formal service of communion or the Lord's Supper. So here we've got this picture that they would gather these groups, these, I don't, I'm going to call them growth groups, but they're early church Christians. They would gather together in smaller groups and they would remember the body and the blood of the Savior. And why would they do that, you might ask? Do you know why we do this? Why we celebrate the Lord's Supper? When you celebrate it, according to both Jesus and Paul's instructions, you are to remember. I am to remember that means to recall, or actually it means more powerfully, to relive as if you're there. The day that Jesus was flogged and beaten and spit on and hung up on that cross and seven words he uttered, seven sayings he uttered, all of them packed with theology, all of them meaningful with life for us. And you relive that every time we celebrate this. And you remember, wait a minute, I can't atone for my own sins. I don't have the power to do this Christian walk alone. I need Christ. And the reason that we do it together is because we need Christ and each other. Which again is the power of fellowship. I will never ever forget. I, don't, I think this was a really good experience for me as a very young pastor i was just the associate pastor here when there was a couple in our church who really didn't like our lead pastor and so instead of celebrating the lord's supper because that would have been in an unworthy manner which paul warns might lead to death or at least sickness you know what they did after the service was done they went out into the hallway outside of the sanctuary, around the corner from everybody else, taking two cups and two pieces of cracker, and there they celebrated it together. That is such an atrocity. That is not the purpose of the Lord's Supper. It is to build the body by reliving the death of Jesus and the means of our salvation alone being him and the power of the fellowship when we celebrate it together. And then there's the prayers forth. We see another priority of these early believers was to be a praying church. What are the prayers? Look at chapter 3 for a second. It's probably on your same page, maybe one page forward. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. 
That means 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They started their days at 6 a.m., so the ninth hour would be 3. And I want to tell you that the devout Jews had three special daily times for prayer. They had morning at 6 a.m., they had noon, and then they had, they had evening prayers. And you could offer those prayers anywhere, but nowhere was more precious than going to the temple. And that's true, actually, in Jerusalem today. So they would go to the temple, and they would offer up these prayers. This is their prayer service. And they would go together. They would go in groups these are the formal times of prayer in the church, and there they would offer their prayers and their petitions to God. Well, you might ask, well, how do you know these are the formal, formal times in the early church? It's because of the definite article. It puts it into that category. Did you know that our elders and our pastors have a Wednesday evening prayer service live on Facebook? And if you were part of it last night, Fall on your knees out at the Lieberman's when 60 or 70 ladies gather to pray and to testify of God's goodness. What a powerful event. These are the things that we need to do. Now listen, I'm going to tell you something. Not just when the leadership of Cornerstone organizes them. You know what we're asking for? You know what we're praying for as the leaders? Is that you who come to Cornerstone would start calling people and say, you know what, let's just stop and pray for our country. We've got a major election coming up. Let's gather this weekend and pray. Or somebody in the church is suffering. Did you get those prayer requests in the email? You know what, let's get together. Let's just spend some time praying for the last several prayer requests that came on our prayer chain. Or let's just get together. We don't need the church to organize it. Let's just get together in our home and let's just spend some time praising and praying. We're waiting for this to start with you guys, not just when we organize it. That's our dream. And when that happens, we will be a spirit-filled church. A church that sat expectantly, devoted regularly under the preaching of the apostles, sharing life together, strengthened by celebrating the Lord's Supper and praying together. But that was part one. Part two is this. Why would you want to be part of a church like this? Why would you want to be part of a church that is devoted regularly to the apostles' preaching, or to the word of God, to the fellowship of the saints, to the sober celebration of the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Why would you want to be part of that kind of a church? Well, look at the first reason, and you're going to see it in the text. This spirit-filled church was a worshiping church, and look what happened. Awe, A-W-E, came upon every soul. Every soul. That's quite complete not most and not some every and this is revival this is spiritual vitality and you're never going to see revival and you're never going to see a lot of vitality if a church lacks the fear of god that's the awe the fear of god is to be in awe of who he is and astonished at his continually revealing himself to you that's the fear of god not oh, i don't want to go near god he might hit the cosmic smite button because I didn't really do very well this week. I had a lot of sin. That's not the fear of God. That ought to propel you into God's mercy so that you could be in awe that his mercy is new every morning and astonished. How could he possibly love me like this? The fear of God is the passionate conviction. This is, I'm going to define it for you. Here is the fear of God. It's the passionate conviction to live life where you place God above everybody and above everything for the sake of his glory and your blessings. I'm going to say it again. It's when you place God over everything and everybody for the sake of his glory and your blessings. And it was brought about, look what the text says, by many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. 
to the Holy Spirit is displaying his power. And that display will lead us toward a fear and an awe of God. And it will open the eyes and the ears of those who witness the signs and the wonders and the miracles. In Hebrews 2, verse 4, we read that the person of Jesus and his message were being confirmed by signs and wonders and various miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Did, now, did you catch what I just said? Because I said a lot. Here's what, he, here's what I just said. Miracles, signs, and wonders were never allowed in the Bible to become more important than the preaching and the person of Jesus. And the tendency, and I've been correcting this throughout our series, in a lot of our churches with a lot of our brothers and sisters that focus on the Spirit of God more than they focus on Jesus, is they hunger for the experiential miracles, wonders, and signs when God is saying, I've given you my word. Let that be your foundation. Let that grow your faith. Let that pull you together in fellowship. The same was with Moses, whom God confirmed to Israel and Pharaoh. You remember the whole story, through signs and wonders, ten plagues. Why did God do that? He was confirming and affirming that Moses was a prophet sent by God. This, the final verse in Mark's gospel tells us that the disciples went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. You see, the role of miracles and the role of signs is always subservient to the message. Its job is to confirm the message and the messenger. Not replace them. And when that happens, awe comes upon the church. Look at the second thing. This spirit-filled church was a generous church as they had all things in common. You know, just this last week, I had a, 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 um, a conversation with an unbelieving friend who was very politically motivated to tell me that if Jesus was alive today, he'd be a socialist. That's what he told me. Now, he's actually not correct. And what we see here in that phrase, had all things in common, is not a picture of socialism, because socialism does not, while it, while it acknowledges the right of private property, it compels individuals to give a percentage above a certain figure to others. There's a compulsionary giving. And it's not communism as the Christian retains the right of private ownership. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. Paul says that to Ananias. It belonged to you, Ananias. You see, both communism and socialism are compulsory. It has nothing to do with biblical generosity, which gives gladly for the sake of others, always motivated by love. Look at verse 45. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. One of the most powerful witnesses of a spirit-filled church is a generous church. Now, if you're writing notes, I'm going to encourage you, you should write that one down. One of the most powerful witnesses of a spirit-filled church is a generous church. Not just a church whose people give generously, but whose people live generously with each other. A church that lives life together. Look at the text. Day by day. Not just once a week on Sundays. Listen, if you're only involved with people from Cornerstone once a week when you come to worship, you're not capturing the early church. The early church is not living, did not live like you're living. Because look at verse 46. Day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Now, if you're a skeptic or a critic, you might be saying, well, come on, that's first century. Of course they could do this. They had jobs. 
They had to work. They had lives in many ways, very similar to ours, yet they made it such a priority to live life together that it filled their hearts with strength and power. And this time, the breaking of bread means they enjoyed meals together. They enjoyed having people over for dinner. They enjoyed, in today's vernacular, going out to dinner and eating and fellowshipping together. But look at the next one and the final one. The spirit-filled church was a witnessing church. Look at verse, the final verse. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now listen, I want you to draw a connection. If I were you, I would underline day by day in that verse and underline it in the preceding verse and draw a line to it. Because day by day, they're attending the temple together. Therefore, day by day, they're seeing people get saved. Do you see that connection? One person said they spent time blessing God, and God spent time blessing them. Can you imagine, friends, our church growing? Not so much by people leaving another church to come here, but because the Spirit is saving the lost, because all of us are out witnessing of Jesus Christ. And after people get saved, we're inviting them to come and grow together with us. That's the church we want to be. And that's not the church that I can make us be. That's the church we all need to devote ourselves regularly to. So I'm going to remind you again, these are the marks of a spirit-filled church. It's a church that is centered on God's word, rich in love for each other, centered on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and one that finds us together, praying to our great God. That kind of church, friends, would fill us with the fear and the awe and the astonishment of God, where he is the priority in all of our lives, over everybody, over everything, to his glory, to our blessings, that's the kind of church that would be a powerful, effective witness to our community. So I'm going to end by asking you some honest questions. And I really want you to answer these honestly, and you're going to see them all on one screen. Is the Spirit of God increasing these attitudes in you? Now, you have to be honest to this, or this exercise is worthless. Do you have a desire that is growing to be part of a growth group, a life group, to live out the one another's of the Bible? Now, I'm going to tell you something on that one. You join a growth group and make it 30% of the time, you're not only not going to grow, you're going to harm your group. So count the cost. Get part of a growth group and commit and live and love and enjoy fellowship. Do you have a desire to be living life with those at Cornerstone day by day, not just once a week? Do you have a desire to pray together with each other at both formal times when we organize it, but informal times that you organize for the sake of this church? Do you have a willingness to share your possessions with others who are in need in this church? Do you have a growing desire to use your home as a place to enjoy meals with others from our church, to invite them in to share life together? Do you have an attentive, yielded heart to the preaching and teaching of the Word of God here and an increasing discipline of studying and reading God's Word throughout the week? And finally, do you have a growing sense of awe and fear that places God above everything and everyone to the glory of God and your blessing? You want to know how to have a church that is spirit-filled? I don't know a clearer teaching 
than Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. And friends, I want to tell you, that could be us. But it takes every single one of us devoting regularly to them. Amen? I hope that causes you to contemplate throughout this week, to make corrections in your life, and to start demonstrating these growing desires in your heart day by day. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this snapshot, Lord, this picture of the first church. Lord, I just wish I could taste it. I wish I could just experience it for a moment and then come back here and live it out even more in my life. Father, I pray that I would embody these marks of a spirit-filled church. Lord, that I would love the word of God even more. Father, that I would love fellowship even more. Lord, that I would love time celebrating soberly the Lord's Supper, that I would love opportunities to pray. Father, I pray that you would begin that work in me, and I pray that you would begin that work in every single one of us, to your glory, to your honor, and in Jesus' name, amen.